Hello, my name is Darren Reedy and I'm the manager of Welcoming and Inclusive Communities Initiative with the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. Welcome to our webinar on understanding the experience of refugees that settle in Alberta. We designed this webinar to increase your knowledge of how a person comes to be a refugee and to highlight a typical journey for a refugee to settle in Canada. We know that over the past year and a half, uh, there has been a lot of media coverage of refugees and we wanted to take an, a, a some time to educate you to give you a better understanding of how you can uh, work to support refugees in your community. We know that uh, approximately 7,000 refugees arrived between November of 2015 and December of 2016. Uh, the majority of those were Syrian refugees, but we also know that there was over 2,000 refugees from other countries. And so the ma large majority of those have uh, settled in the major cities in Alberta, but we also know that they are dispersed throughout the province in numerous communities through uh, migration or through uh, being a privately sponsored refugee. So for those of you that are not aware, um, we are hosting this webinar on March 21st in recognition of the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And today is recognized due to, due to an event on March 21st, 1960, where 69 people were killed and over 300 people injured at a peaceful demonstration in South Africa when police opened fire on unarmed protesters who were opposing the apartheid pass laws. The pass laws were a repressive tool used to control the movements of black South Africans. In response to this event, the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed March 21st the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in 1966. We felt that a webinar on refugees would be appropriate on today because of the various ways that refugees are found to be victims of discrimination, whether it be based on race or other factors. And so at this point, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our speakers. We have uh, two people joining us, Caitlin Lauridson from CRC Consulting and Niga Jalal from Multicultural Health Brokers Cooperative. Niga has over 10 years of experience working for non-governmental organizations, government affairs at municipal level and in Kurdistan and areas of social inclusion and settlement. She has worked with the city of Edmonton as a multicultural liaison officer, outreach consultant, Edmonton John Howard Society as employment facilitator, and multicultural health brokers, multicultural health brokers program coordinator. In 2009, 2010, and 2011, she was part of a team who received the Diversity and Inclusion Award from Edmonton's Mayor and YMCA Peace Medal for demonstrating activities that value peace and understanding. She's an honor, honors graduate from the University of Alberta. <laughs> she is an honors graduate from the University of Alberta, specializing in political science and English literature. Caitlin Lauridson is a senior consultant and educator with CRC Consulting, the social enterprise arm of the Center for Race and Culture. A passionate facilitator, Caitlin is dedicated to asking the uncomfortable questions and encouraging her audiences to dig deeper and get curious. Caitlin completed her master's in public health where she researched, uh, her research examined racism as a determinant of health and educational outcomes for junior high school students. She enjoys the learning she gains out of, our, out of each workshop as much as she enjoys delivering them. Uh, before I turn it over to them, I want to highlight that we we had Caitlin and Nika in for a workshop in January in our office, and we found it to be so successful, and the feedback we received was so great that we wanted to provide this uh, through a webinar so that people across the province who we knew weren't able to travel to come to that event uh, would be able to have access to this information. So at this time, I'll, I'll turn it over to them, and I uh, look forward to hearing their presentation. Wonderful, thank you, Darren, for that very warm and welcoming introduction to Nika and myself. So my name is Kiva Howardson, and as Darren said, I'm with the Center for Race and Culture. Before we get in, I wanted to open this session with a quote by author Chimamanda Adichie, and she says, nobody is ever just a refugee. Nobody is ever just a single thing. And yet, in public discourse today, we often speak as people as a single thing, a refugee, an immigrant. So really, this, this project came about in an attempt to provide accurate and comprehensive information about refugees to host communities here in Alberta. And 
to highlight this is an important piece to creating inclusive and welcoming communities. So before we go any further, I just want to ask folks if you could type in where are you tuning in from today, just to get a sense of where everyone is located in the province. Wonderful. So we're seeing lots of folks from Edmonton, but also Hinton, Medicine Hat. Great. Thank you so much. So before I get into the project a little bit more, I'll allow my co-facilitator to introduce herself today. So I'll turn it over to Niga. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin and Darren, for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Niga, and before we begin, I want to um, say Nodo Stampidos. Today is the Kurdish New Year, and I'm um, here um, joining you in this webinar while my family back in Iraq is celebrating and having picnics. But I'm very, very happy to be here, and I'm very excited that there are so many participants um, joining us here today. Um, this project is very dear and near to my heart. We're coming towards the end of this project um, the, uh, as it began uh, back in September in a collaboration between Center for Race and Culture and the Multicultural Health Workers. We got a generous funding from the Government of Alberta Ministry of Labor, Immigrant, Settlement and uh, Language Programs to deliver 20 workshops across Alberta on refugee awareness. We have so far delivered 21 workshops and we're finishing up our last workshop in Red Deer on Thursday. It's been a uh, very, very exciting project as we got to learn so much about our wonderful province and the interests around the areas of refugees as well as um, being able to answer, to uh, raise some awareness around the topic that's been in the media uh, for the past year uh, in so many different ways. So I'm eager to share um, the information today. We usually present in full day workshops and people still end up asking us uh, to stay a little bit longer and to have another workshop. So in the next hour, we hope to um, change the world together. So um, thank you for the opportunity and I'll uh, hand it back to Caitlin. Great, so picking up on Niga, why did we put this proposal, this project together? So we recognize that the majority of settlement funding is focused on preparing refugees to integrate and participate in their communities, which is, is a very important and key piece to integration and settlement. However, there tends to be very little focus on preparing the host community. And this is also another key piece in the process of settlement and integration. Host communities, host individuals have a very key role in creating receptive and positive climates for refugees to settle and integrate into. And as the United Nations has noticed, had noted, fostering truly welcoming communities can be the most challenging aspect of integrating refugees. So really our project sparked between our two organizations coming together to say, how can we sort of flip some of this narrative and take the focus away from what do just refugees need to do to integrate and settle to also what can we as host communities do to create truly inclusive and welcoming communities. And that's what we'll be taking you through today. So just to walk through a quick outline of what we'll be covering in our presentation, we're going to ground ourselves in some definitions to begin with. There's lots of terminology used around refugees. And often we come to this work with maybe different understandings of what some of these terms mean. So we'll dive a little bit deeper into some of the common terms used around refugees and the refugee process. Next, we'll explore a little bit around the pre-migration reality in Syria and experience of refugee camps and really cap pre-migration journey and story. That's such an essential uh, part of the refugee process, important piece to really understand in moving forward towards integration and what can support best programs and policies. We'll then move into a little bit on settlement and, in and integration. Take a look at what, what are those settlement services provided. So typically we like to ask folks at this time, what are some of those common myths you've heard about refugees in your community, in the news? So actually, even as we're talking here, if anyone wants to type in, what are some of the common myths, common stories, or common narratives that you've heard over the past year and a half, two years, around refugees in your own community? So if anyone feels comfortable just to type some, some of those narratives or myths you, you've heard in. A little bit of what we want this workshop to do is provide you with the skills and capacities to help debunk some of those myths. And then we will end the session. Before we move on to questions, Nigo will share a little bit of a best practice example 
in the settlement organization or the support center that she works in, focusing on a project she's working on with Syrian youth. So I guess a couple more notes just before we jump in a little bit further. We just wanted to highlight that although this project was focused around Syrian refugees specifically, there is a lot of information that can be generalized to refugee communities more broadly. And so we want you just to keep that in mind as we, as we move through this presentation. Nick, is there anything else I've missed that you want to touch base on? No, keep going. Perfect. So one of the myths we had come up was refugees aren't working and the taxpayer is carrying the burden. Coming in illegally guarantees a quick citizenship. Yeah, so definitely that first narrative there around refugees aren't working and the taxpayer, we've heard that it's an interesting narrative on both sides. You often hear the narrative of refugees aren't working and they're a burden or refugees are taking our jobs. So it's interesting how that narrative exists on both sides. So Nigo will get into that a little bit later today. So thank you, Kathy, for sharing that. So as I mentioned, we wanted to ground the session before we go too much further in some definitions. So we'll start off with the definition of a refugee. So we've used the United Nations High Commission for Refugees definition of a refugee, which is a person who is outside their country of nationality who has been forced to flee because of persecution, war, or violence. A refugee has a well-founded fear of persecution due to race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Most commonly, they cannot return home or are afraid to do so. So what is important to know about this definition is a refugee is a legal status designated by the UNHCR. It's defined and protected in international law. It is important to note that to receive the status of a refugee, you must be outside your country's borders. So if, for example, uh, you're within Syria, maybe you've been displaced from your home city, but you remained within Syria, you'd be considered an internally displaced person and not a refugee. You need to actually leave the, the border of your country. And thus, this starts sort of multiple, multiple migration processes for refugees. There's often multiple movements and multiple displacements from home and host countries. So just to highlight, a refugee might identify or have a well-founded fear of persecution under one of these five elements, race, religion, nationality, social group, and that could be something such as social group based on your sexual orientation or political opinion. So as a refugee, once you leave that border or cross into, cross into a, new, a new country, you have to sort of prove your, that you're at risk, that you have a fear for your life. It's also important just to make note, under the definition of refugee, it really is not a choice. People are being forced to flee. So that's really an important piece to really highlight and remember from this definition, is you're being forced to flee because of fear for your life and safety. Another definition that commonly comes up when talking about refugees is what's the difference between a refugee and a refugee claimant? So in a very simple terms, a refugee claimant is someone who is in that process of applying for refugee status or receiving that legal status. So a refugee claimant is a person who faces persecution in their home country or the country where they normally live or would face persecution if they return to that country. Within Canada, a refugee claim is made when you arrive by land, sea, or air. So refugee claimant is often used interchangeably with the word asylum seeker. So you may have heard that word come up as well, and, and they tend to sort of be used interchangeably. Within Canada, we use the word uh, claimant more often, and it's the term used under Canadian law. So really, again, the difference is a refugee claimant is someone who's in that process of applying for status, and again, they're outside the borders of their country. So in the case of Syrian refugees, that would be crossing borders into Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, et cetera.
Next, we have the definition of an immigrant. So the definition we've he used here is a person who comes to a country to take up a permanent residence. So often the key distinguishing factor between an immigrant and a refugee is an immigrant is someone who's making that act of choice. So there's an element of choice where they're deciding to apply for residency in a different country. Whereas as a refugee, as we mentioned, that choice isn't isn't something that they're they're deciding for themselves it's being made for them due to the circumstances around them whether that's war violence famine natural disasters etc that's influencing the decision for them i just wanted to make a quick note around this definition however looking also at statistics canada which phrases their definition of immigrants slightly differently statistics canada says an immigrant is a person residing in Canada who was born outside of Canada, excluding temporary foreign workers. Canadian citizens born outside of Canada and those with student or working visas are also considered immigrants. So Statistic Canada tends to take the definition or term of immigrant as a broader umbrella term for anyone residing in Canada who was born outside of Canada. So that would encompass refugees, um, you know, temporary residents such as students or those on work visas, etc. So sometimes immigrant is used as a broader umbrella term, but here we're making that little bit of a distinction between an immigrant and refugee. And as Nigo will pick up in a little bit, this is important because they have different migration journeys to Canada, and that influences the supports and resources that they may need moving forward. The final definition that we wanted to share with you is a definition of social inclusion. We've used a definition from the Institute of Wellbeing, which talks about social inclusion as it, a way to describe how a society values all of its residents, respects their differences, and ensures everyone's basic needs are met, and welcomes and enables full participation in that society. An inclusive society is one which cultivates the skills and abilities of its residents and communities and works towards a goal of equal opportunity and freedom from discrimination. There are a lot of elements that we really like in this definition, and one in particular is in that second paragraph, which says, socially inclusive society cultivates the skills and abilities of its residents and communities. So in this sense, we're already recognizing the strengths and skills that everyone brings to the table. And this is often a piece missed when talking about and working with refugee communities. We often forget the immense amount of skills and strengths that refugees bring with them. And we often don't tap, tap into those strengths and acknowledge them as much as we really need to. And I think that is what being socially inclusive can really start out with, is acknowledgement that everyone has skills and strengths and just finding better ways to tap into those, to use those, to create a broader, very rich community for all of us to live in. I also really appreciate that this definition of social inclusion talks about this idea of freedom from discrimination. Because I also think when we talk about refugees and integration into our communities, refugees often don't come with this expectation that they'll experience or face discrimination upon arrival. And we've really seen that increase in the past few months or the past few years, particularly for Muslim communities or even Muslim-looking communities, have often been painted with this, with this brush of, of fear and received significant amount of discrimination. So I think that's something important just to keep in mind as we move forward. So just a final note on social inclusion. When we talk about social inclusion in sort of a traditional sense, we tend to think of people having access to some of those basic needs, which are listed on the left. So that's stuff like food, suitable housing, those essential material goods, so a roof over your head, clothing, health, medical care, et cetera. And that's where we really see that first six months to a year of settlement services really focusing on those, those core and basic needs. And what we need to do as communities as well is start to think about all those other participatory activities that lead to social inclusion, that contribute to welcoming and, and very rich and vibrant communities. And those are activities like employment, education and continued education, arts and cultural activities, sports and recreation, 
And then also thinking about equal voice in processes like elections or consultations, decision making, being involved in those processes. So when we talk about social inclusion throughout the rest of the presentation or as we think about it, we'd encourage you to think about this other realm, sort of this second slide of what are we also doing in, in these fields to foster inclusion of refugees in our communities. So that's a very quick summary of definitions. I just want to open it up if there's any last question or any questions around definitions before we move into exploring the refugee journey or that pre-migration process a little bit further. Okay. Well, it's okay if you're still typing a question. I'm going to turn it over to Niga to take us through the refugee pre-migration experience a little bit further. But please type any questions that you do have. Thank you, Caitlin. So for the next um, 10, 15 minutes, we're going to dive into the pre-migration journey of refugees. There's a lot of misconception about how do refugees come to Canada? What is the process like? Do they um, get on a plane and land in Canada automatically? What do they do? What is the process like? Um, we hope to clarify um, that process in the next 10 minutes and as well as um, think about the refugee journey. Um, what is the pre-migration story of each family? Their story really start, doesn't start when they come into Canada. They had a story before coming to Canada and it's really, really important for us to make sure that we know about where, the people, where these refugees are coming from, what stories do they bring with them to Canada and to continue from those stories on rather than um, think that their story really starts from the day that they arrive in Canada. So with that being said, oopsies, okay, so who is a refugee? Um, a person who is outside of their country has a well-founded fear of prosecution on one of the five grounds that Caitlin uh, clarified earlier and this is a person who is unable to go back to their home country. A refugee, like Caitlin said, is a legal definition and currently um, the numbers of refugee are the highest that they've ever been um, in, the, in history. There are 65 million refugees worldwide. And that number is really the highest that they've ever been. And from that 65 million, only about 2% get considered for resettlement. And what resettlement is, is 30 countries who have made an agreement um, to resettle refugees who are currently in host countries and waiting to um, live in a third safe country. To qualify for the UNHCR resettlement criteria, you have to have legal and physical protection needs. You have to be a survivor of violence and torture, medical needs, women at risk, family reunification, children, adolescents, elderly refugees, and as well as refugees without local integration prospects. So these are criteria that will um, advance you to the resettlement criteria. However, um, many refugees who do get um, advanced to the resettlement criteria don't necessarily end up in a third safe country. Canada is one of the 30 countries that has the resettlement agreement with UNHCR. Some refugees actually um, get considered to uh, come to Canada. This is the process that they have to follow. So there's a security and health screening process. Um, the refugee has to be identified by UNHCR in the resettlement uh, program and then referred to IRCC. And why, what IRCC is, that is it's Immigration Resettlement Citizenship Canada. Once you get resettled, uh, once you get referred from UNHCR into IRCC and an experienced immigration and security officer at that host country will conduct an interview with the family. This interview really is to make sure that the families qualify for the resettlement criteria, have the proofs um, to, to uh, have the proofs for the stories that they are, um, that have the have the proof and the documentation that they need um, to, to be qualified in the resettlement criteria and um, as well as just to make sure that they are 
they are eligible um, to come to Canada. And uh, from that, so of course, you need identity and documentation verification, and that might be your passport, your citizenship, or any, uh, any official documentation that you have to present to the uh, visa officer. Um, when you go through that stage, then you go through a health screening process. And this health screening process is to make sure that you are healthy to arrive to Canada. So any, if you might have any um, medical conditions that might harm other Canadians, you're automatically removed from that list and are not uh, qualified for resettlement. Once you go through the health screening process, there is an identity confirmation prior to departure and done through Canada Border Service Agencies. Um, that as well as to reaffirm um, uh, you are who you say you are and that um, your life is in danger and you are qualified for the resettlement um, uh, program with UNHCR. And once you go through that, there is an identity verification upon and a final health check um, from in, in Canada. And this really, this process, when we think about it, going through it as uh, point by point, um, can any of you just type how long it might take to go through that security and health screening process as a refugee in a host country? I would love to see some numbers right now in the chat box. One year. OK. So it's actually a minimum of two and a half years. A uh, minimum two and a half years to go through the security and health training process uh, to make sure that you are eligible for the um, to come to a third safe country. Most of the refugees that I've worked with um, here in Edmonton have actually um, took them anywhere between three to five years to get through that process. So really, the minimum years to go through that process is two and a half years, specifically speaking on a personal level, that for my family, it took two and a half years um, in, to stay in Turkey before we were able to arrive in Canada. Um, the part that takes the longest um, to go through is the security and health screening process. Um, the security process takes anywhere between eight to 12 months. Two and, two and a half years, is this for legal immigrants and illegal? It's for um, legal immigrants through the UNHCR resettlement program. Sure. And Kathy, this is sort of in response to your comment there. Is this for legal or illegal immigrants? And I think. Maybe a better way to phrase it is sort of, is this through the more common official process that we hear about or otherwise? And I think this term illegal is, is quite problematic because it tends to criminalize individuals who are really searching for a life because their life is in immediate danger. And I think what's interesting to think about in today's world is we have very open and free trade of goods and materials, but we really restrict the migration of people and, and people who can be in very uh, severe conditions uh, of war or violence that they're trying to create from. Yeah, thanks, Brent, for that comment around documented versus undocumented. Yeah, is, is possibly a bit better term. I just try and encourage us to, to move away from that term of illegal because it really connotates sort of that criminality or, or criminalizing people who are really being forced to flee from no choice of their own. For the sake of presentation, we will be talking about refugees who come to Canada through the UNHCR resettlement process. And this is what most majority, majority, 95% of Syrian refugees have came to Canada through. It's through the UNHCR resettlement program. And the UNHCR resettlement program, like we said, takes anywhere between two and a half years to five years in a host country before you are eligible to come to Canada or before you arrive to Canada. So where are Syrians now? 95% of Syrian refugees live in just five countries. Uh, there's 1.9 million that live in Turkey, 1.2 million that live in Lebanon, 636,000 refugees that live in Jordan, 249,000 that live in Iraq, and finally 132,000 that live in Egypt. 
So actually, Turkey is the largest host country for Syrian refugees. And the remaining 5% live in the rest of the world. And from that 5%, majority are in European countries, which would be in Germany and in Sweden. Canada took in 25,000 uh, refugees. Just to think about that number, there is about 8 million Syrian refugees under UNHCR right now who are currently looking for a safe country and who are refugees. And 95% of them live in five countries. So there are two refugee streams in Canada. It's government-assisted refugees as well as privately sponsored refugees. Government-assisted refugees, they get initial settlement in Canada entirely supported by the government. Um, they arrive as permanent residents. And their settlement support uh, is provided through Catholic Social Services, CSS, or in um, other cities, there's other settlement agencies that provide that support for the six weeks um, of arrival. And they get up to one year of financial assistance from the federal government under the RAP program. So it's refugee assistance program. The private sponsors, however, are sponsors by family members, church groups, groups of five or more. They also arrived to Edmonton as permanent residents. However, the sponsors are um, tasked with finding them accommodation and schools, and they're responsible for connecting them to health care and are required to financially support the families for that first year. The difference between privately and government-sponsored families really just essentially comes down to the um, settlement support uh, services that are offered to the families as well as the financial um, assistance program. So my family in 1999 on a very, very cold January day came to Canada as a government-sponsored refugees. And we um, we came to Canada, um, landed in Toronto, and uh, after that arrived in Edmonton, and we were provided with um, a settlement broker through uh, Catholic Social Services and uh, sent into a reception house for the first week of arriving in Edmonton. So we came to Canada through the UNHCR's uh, resettlement program as government-sponsored refugees um, from Iraq. At that time, Iraq was going through a very severe civil war, and my dad was a writer in Kurdistan writing against the regime at that time there. His life was in danger. Um, he found a way to smuggle out of Iraq into Turkey, and uh, luckily Canada accepted us as refugees, and we have been here ever since uh, in, our, in our new home. So for, to look at the numbers um, for Alberta, currently in Edmonton, there is 2,156 2, refugees. And that's a combination of sponsored and um, privately sponsored refugees. In Calgary, there is 2,218 refugees. In Lethbridge, there is 229. Red Deer has 193. And Medicine has 152 refugees. And we've been lucky enough to present in all of those cities um, uh, about refugee awareness. Just to clarify, Miga, those, you're referring to Syrian refugees uh, for those numbers, right? Definitely, yes. I'm referring to Syrian refugees. And those numbers are quite high for 2016. For 2017, we're expecting significantly lower numbers. Um, uh, actually, they will go down to the uh, uh, num the the numbers that the uh, government of, of of Canada has usually sponsored refugees um, around, uh, which is about twelve to fourteen thousand refugees each year. So uh, for two thousand seventeen, uh, the numbers will definitely decrease uh, significantly. Are there any questions about the refugee process? OK. Well, if you're still typing or if you're still thinking about the questions, you'll be given an opportunity in the end of this uh, session to ask uh, questions. 
So I will now give you the shortest history um, overview that you probably will ever get um, about Syria. Like we said, this is for the purpose of really knowing where um, the Syrian refugees come from and what their story is and why they're fleeing their home country. This is a map of Middle East. This map is a very uh, new invention. It's actually, uh, it was carved out after for, uh, the First World War I by the uh, victors of the war. So at that time, it was the United uh, Kingdom as well as uh, uh, France. So before, um, before the World War I, this region was uh, all under the Ottoman uh, Empire, and there were really no borders in those countries. And when those borders were carved, um, there was little consideration uh, that was put into ethnic and the religious background of the people in that region. For example, I myself come from Iraq, I'm part of a minority, Kurdish minority in Iraq. Uh, we speak a completely different language than Arabs. Um, our culture is very different from the Arab culture. However, we were put uh, under um, the same region as, um, as uh, Arabs, and uh, that has resulted in many conflicts um, since, uh, since those borders were created. And same with Syria. Syria is a very, very diverse country. I'm just going to get you to look at the uh, PowerPoint here. So definitely a very, very diverse country. Um, Syria has Muslim Syrians um, who come from the Sunni background as well as the Shiite background. There are Orthodox Christians in Syria. There are Arabs. There are Kurds um, as Syrians and smaller numbers of Armenian and Turkmen. So as you can see, a very, very diverse country under a very small region, um, if we look at the borders here. So naturally, there was a lot of resistance to the colonial power in the, uh, after uh, the World War I, so from between 1916 to the 1940s. And finally, in 1944, Syria gained independence from the colonial power. And there were several shifts in government between um, 1944 to current times. Uh, we, Syria actually uh, was uh, under two main leaders, um, one of them being Bashar al-Assad, that father, Hafiz Assad, who passed away in the early 2000s, and his son came into power after that. And naturally, people wanted a change of power. They wanted democratic reforms, civil liberties, and freedom. They wanted to be able to make their own decisions, which resulted in a revolution. At that time, there was an Arab Spring that was going all around Middle East, um, demanding um, democratic freedoms and civil liberties, and Syria was part of that revolution. However, for Syria, it didn't end as well as the other countries, because um, the, the leader, who is still the leader in, in Syria, Bashar al-Assad, refused to resign. Since then, things have gotten very, very complicated, because there has been neighboring countries who have involved. There is Russia, who is now involved, um, Iran, who is now involved, and really at the cost of innocent people. So no one knows what side to pick in this war, um, who really started out with four people uh, writing anti-graffiti, uh, anti Assad graffiti on the wall, uh, which resulted in them being shot and imprisoned, and um, now has turned into a into a huge chaos between many different groups um, at the cost of innocent people. Since then, um, and actually in about a matter of matter of three months, 256,000 Syrians uh, lost their lives uh, due to this conflict. Are there any questions about the brief history that you received uh, on Syria? Okay. I think one thing that's important to note too about Syria is Syria, prior to the conflict breaking out there, was home to a lot of Iraqi refugees. And it actually itself was a host country for many thousands of refugees who then post-conflict in Syria also experienced another form of displacement. 
Exactly. So many of the Syrian refugees that I currently work with now struggle with the fact that they're refugees because they once were host countries for other neighboring countries like Iraq and have been a home for um, uh, for millions of refugees uh, from Palestinians to Iraqis. And now they're refugees themselves. And um, Syria is actually, I definitely encourage you to watch documentaries and um, uh, YouTube videos and do some research on Syria. There are many great writers that come from Syria. Their movies, their TV shows are known all across the Middle East. Um, their um, IT, uh, uh, and their IT was leading in all of the Middle East. So they're really, really smart, vibrant um, uh, people from that region. Um, they just so happen to be to be under a very cruel leadership and um, in the wrong border, in my opinion. So for for this part of this presentation, what is what does that mean? What now that that Syria is you know in conflict and there is a war going on and people are fleeing, um, uh, trying to find safe refuge anywhere in the neighboring countries. What is what is the impact of that migration on war on people? As we know, like I said, there's 8 million uh, Syrian refugees uh, right now who are in host countries and really cannot go back to, to Syria because cities like Aleppo and Dara are completely con just, just destructed. It's dismantled. The city is no longer a place where people, people can go back to. Okay. So... When they do flee um, Syria uh, and go into the host uh, countries, now by smuggling actually, because many of the host countries have closed off their borders and are no longer accepting um, uh, refugees due to the high numbers. Like I said, Lebanon has 1.2 million refugees and the Le population in Lebanon is between 4 to 5 million themselves. So it's been a huge burden on those host countries and the borders are, are, are closed. But when, do, when they do get to those, um, uh, those host countries, uh, many of the families end up in refugee camps that are um, constructed by UNHCR. And I had a chance to work at a refugee camp myself when I was in Iraq uh, about a year and a half ago. I just came back to Canada from being in Iraq for about two years. And um, I had the pleasure and uh, the honor of meeting many of those uh, refugees who are affected by the violence in Syria uh, in Iraq. I worked um, at, a, at a refugee camp in the northern region of Iraq, Kurdistan. And um, when when I think about a refugee, when I thought about a refugee camp before going um, into into uh, the refugee camps in Iraq, I very sad um, images came to my mind. But uh, but when I first walked into that camp, I still remember I was um, over. I overcame. There was. I was inspired, to say the least, because I seen people who had been affected by so much violence and so much unfortune, but yet still making a life for themselves. So there was barber shops, there were salon shops, there was bakeries, grocery stores, schools operated by teachers um, who have fled Syria, medical clinics who are operated by Syrians themselves. So really, Syrians making a life for themselves under very, very horrible conditions. And there are horrible conditions. Um, there are curfews that they're not allowed to work as being part of that or as being part of a refugee camp. Um, you're not allowed to leave the refugee camp after 6 p.m. And oftentimes um, there's conflicts between host countries and and um, and the refugees. So, but it really shows the resiliency. Uh, I learned a lot about re the resiliency of Syrians themselves um, uh, in those in those camps, and I learned to know that. They all come with very rich history and very rich stories um, that I had the opportunity to learn about. Thanks, Nigga. And I think while we recognize that not all refugees who come to Canada spend time in a refugee camp, many of our government-sponsored refugees do spend time in a refugee camp because, as Niga highlighted earlier, Canada in the government sponsors tends to sponsor the most vulnerable and we sponsor those who are documented under the United Nations who most would reside in a refugee camp. So if refugees enter into a host country, often their options is to integrate and sort of live within the community or the city they find themselves 
or enter into a refugee camp. And it's really those who, who really don't have any resources, any maybe larger social capital or social networks who are able to provide some funds for an apartment, <laughs> say, in a, in a community, will really enter into a refugee camp. So the next section we wanted to touch on briefly, and again, um, through all of these components, we're just being able to give a, a quick snapshot. But lots of folks act, ask us about the mental health impact on, on that migration experience, migration journey, um, or just notice mental health issues among refugee populations. And it's true, so high proportions of, of refugees who are come do suffer symptoms of trauma, quite understandably, from the circumstance of that they've gone through. This is a case for the majority of Syrian refugees who've come in, and as well as Iraqi refugees. Most have witnessed shootings and bombings. Most have had someone close to them killed. Many have been interrogated or beaten. And a lot of refugees report feelings of anger, hopelessness, <coughs> loss of dignity, and humiliation, which quite understandable are, are very reasonable and rational emotions to experience after incredible trauma, violence, war in your community, in your country. We wanted to present one model to talk about or to look at mental health, and that's something called the ADAPT model. And the ADAPT model stands for the adaptation and development after persecution and trauma. So this framework was really put together to look at to look at mass trauma or mass conflict in countries. So at the time when it was sort of created and, and it's from the academic realm, they realized that there's something unique when an entire group of people experience mass trauma together. So the ADAPT model is really a framework for understanding what is disrupted during mass conflict, such as war, in places like Syria or Iraq, or a number of places around, around the world. So the ADAPT model recognizes that there is a, continu a continuum of adaptive and maladaptive psychological responses to conflict and to mass conflict. And it's actually very quite impressive how most individuals are able to adapt under high stress Pressure, pressure situations or high stress around them. The majority of us are able to adapt and accommodate to a high stress situation where our nervous system is almost left in that on position all the time. You have heightened arousal awareness. And then it's quite impressive that post-conflict or when placed in a safe situation again, most people are able to make that adaptation back to feelings of safety and stability. So it's really quite impressive how the brain is able, the brain and body are able to really adapt to severe and extreme conditions that, the, that um, humans are placed under. So what we like about the ADAPT model, as I'm pulling up on the next screen here, is the ADAPT model states that stable societies are grounded on five core psychosocial pillars. And they say that during mass conflict, war, violence, all of these pillars are disrupted. And what we appreciate about this model and thinking about mental health is it broadens our understanding of what contributes to mental health and how we could create differential programs or policies to support um, safe mental health, um, yes, a return to sort of stable mental health in, in safe, safe conditions now. So typically when we think about mental health, we think more of that direct, we think of sort of in the line of mental illness and we go right to sort of depression, anxiety, and we try to fix things at an individual level. This model opens that up a little bit more and says actually there are five important pillars we should be thinking on. One being safety, the second being attachment and bonds, the third being identity, the fourth being meaning and purpose, and the fifth being justice. So as I mentioned, for refugees, all of these pillars are disrupted through, during their process. So just to touch on a little, uh, a little bit further on each one, safety is, is sort of an obvious one. We see how that pillar is, is easily broken for individuals who are fleeing. They don't have that sense of safety anymore, hence why they're leaving their, their hometown and their home country. How we can see this translate still upon arrival in a host country like Canada is people may take a while to 
feel that sense of safety again. So it's important to get to know what does safety mean for the individuals that you're working with, with the families that you're working with. What is considered safe to them? Because that can also mean different things to different people. For some people, safety will take a long time, can translate into behaviors that avoid triggers that created sort of unsafe conditions. The second one is attachment and bonds. So again, throughout the migration process, you can probably understand there is a lot of disconnection, a lot of uh, breakage of bonds between families, families being torn apart. So an important part when thinking about how do we rebuild that in our programs and policies are really creating opportunities for families to reunite, for families to build support networks around them, for families to connect with other family members and friends who may have been left behind or have not been given the opportunity to resettle in a country such as Canada. But it can also look like attachment and bonds. Often in times of trauma and conflict, there's no time to mourn or grieve those who've been lost. So it's also thinking about how do we provide individuals spaces and opportunities to grieve and mourn those who may have been lost on the journey. Number four, meaning and purpose. So throughout this process, lots of individuals may lose sort of what gave them meaning and purpose beforehand. So as it mentions here, what is my purpose? Who am I? Where do I fit in? And this also overlaps a bit with identity. So one minute, one day, you know, you could be working as a teacher. The next, the next day, you're being forced to flee. And then you come to Canada, your credentials are not recognized. And you almost have to reimagine who are you if your identity for years has been that as a teacher or a doctor or an engineer all of a sudden you're unable to practice those professions or would take a long time to be able to practice those professions again. You need to think about what is my identity then? Who, who am I? Or we can think of this in terms of parents who've lost children as well. What is, what is my identity now that I, I may have lost one of my, my children along this process? What is the future for my children? So many refugees here come with that hope and really live through their children allowing their children to have a better life, a very safe upbringing life. And education is something that's really valued among a lot of refugee families that we see here. The last pillar is justice. And injustice is a part of every part of refugees' experience and almost at every part of that journey. Like we mentioned, this element of choice has really been taken away from refugees for a lot of, for a lot of elements, that choice to even leave. The choice of which host country to, to cross a border into is usually left to either what borders open or what, what border is closest to you, where you're able to settle. So refugees aren't able to pick what host country they settle in. So they, they aren't able to say, yes, I want to go to Canada. What happens is an offer is presented to them that says, you know, Canada has agreed to accept you as a ref as, uh, for resettlement. Do you, do you accept that offer? So really, Allowing folks, allowing refugees to have a voice in processes again can be a very huge part to, to rebuilding this, this pillar around justice. And I just want to add to the ADAPT model um, a little bit further for a minute here. Uh, we actually, uh, right now, with the limitations uh, on mental health and mental wellness, it's uh, to see a therapist, um, uh, right now there's a six to eight weeks wait list. So we have families one year later who are finally ready to talk about things that they have um, uh, went through uh, before coming to Canada ready to talk to somebody and there's a there's a very long wait list to see to see a therapist and our response to that at the multicultural health workers with the uh, support of Catholic social services is to um, train Syrian uh, leaders in the adapt model um, and help them take that knowledge back into their communities and have those discussions around those five pillars uh, and um, I thought um, in having conversations with these Syrian leaders that one of the most important pillar would be safety. But um, to my surprise, it turned out that the most uh, important pillar that they wanted to talk more about was identity. So in, they are now in, an, in a new country and they're more interested to know about how do I fit in? Where am I? What's, what am I going to do in this country? And how do I move forward? And how do, what kind of, um, support is available while I try and figure that out. So in just talking to the parents and the youth, um, identity was one of the most important pillars uh, for them. 
So we have five minutes, and we will, uh, we, in those five minutes, we will go uh, through the settlement integration process uh, for, for uh, all refugees uh, specific to Syrian refugees um, uh, for this session. Oops, okay. So, key phases uh, for Syrian refugees' movement to Edmonton. This is actually similar to all refugees who come to Edmonton, all government-sponsored refugees. So, you arrive at the airport, um, you meet uh, at the airport with each reception or settle settlement. Um, from there, you travel to the reception house, um, and that may be for however long until you are found a permanent accommodation. Um, there is a small uh, startup uh, fund that you're given to uh, buy your kitchenette, beddings, pillows, things that you will need in the apartment. And for those six weeks, the settlement broker will work with you to register you in school, to register you, um, uh, to get you a healthcare card, uh, to get you a bank card, to make sure that all of the um, kids go to school and the parents are. Um, uh, connected to the link programs, so the English language programs. For the Syrian case, there was a very long wait list for the moms because of child minding. So that that became a huge issue that ended up with the moms staying home and the dads um, going to school. And um, other other um, instances that we can't get into in detail right now for the sake of the short time that we have. But it's um, it looks like a simple process, but it's a it's a it's a very long complex process for for the families that do arrive in Edmonton. And I encourage you to uh, visit um, the websites like the Multicultural Health Workers, Catholic Social Services, Center for Race and Culture to find out more uh, information about um, these type of this uh, process as well. Um, I know there was some interest around uh, the finances and refu what refugees do get. So the resettlement assistance financial support program for one person is maximum $740. For two people, it's $940. For three people, it's $1,100. And for 10 people, it's maximum $2,200. This does not include the child benefit tax, but this is um, for the uh, resettlement assistance program that families do get. And when we think about um, how much apartment costs and bus passes and and the types of bills that we have to pay. Um, to think about that numbers, it's actually um, very low, and the families are um, struggling, struggling to get by one year later, and are very, very eager um, to find to find employment. So yes, they are very much eager to work, but there are also some constraints on working. Um, a doctor in Syria cannot practice medicine here. A teacher can no longer be a teacher. So really, they're looking for any types of work that they can get their hands on. But even that uh, tends to be quite difficult because of the limited English the families do speak. Healthcare as well is um, is huge within the Syrian community because many of the moms um, would love to want to go to that doctor because the doctor and the hospital is a place of safety, place of security. And um, for many Syrians, a doctor is really the person that can help you solve your uh, medical and your life um, difficulties. So the doctor, uh, the healthcare is a huge uh, part of um, the refugee settlement process. Housing, um, Housing, again, um, many of the families are um, settled uh, in one uh, specific uh, uh, specific part of Edmonton, which is the uh, northeast and east side of Edmonton. And uh, our office is located very close to the family. So it's that can be good and bad. You get a sense of community, but also that hinders with your integration prospect of learning English and really getting connected to the greater community that Edmonton does have to offer. Employment um, is is a huge barrier. Uh, jobs are are quite, to be honest, it's it's the quite the jobs are hard to find for um, Canadian-born and English speakers, let alone refugees who do not uh, speak English. So employment is is a barrier for many of the families. 
and I'm told that I have two minutes. In those two minutes, I would love to share a model with you that we are uh, working on with the Multicultural Health Brokers and MFRS. And uh, we have a satellite office over on 97th Street to support Syrian families. And this is one of our youth groups that um, comes together every Tuesdays from 4 to 6 and really talks about the types of things that they would love to do. Uh, this youth group has volunteered at Hope Mission. They've volunteered at Mustard Seed. They've volunteered at Senior Homes. And these are all Syrians who have arrived with in the last year and they're all eager to work and to support their families because they realize that mom and dad um, cannot find a job and they're the ones the responsibility really comes down to them to uh, um, take away some of that um, uh, some of the troubles from their financial troubles away from their parents and um, uh, if anyone is interested in learning more about youth group I definitely encourage you to connect back uh, with me my contact information is available on this PowerPoint and I would love to get you connected to any of our youth groups and our parenting programs that we have um, at our center and this really this model is a model that was uh, created through the youth themselves uh, one hot summer day we asked them what they would love to do and they said that we want to learn more about volunteering because we understand that in this new community we don't have the Canadian working experience we want to gain the volunteer experience for us to find jobs in Edmonton we want to learn about how we can parent our parents because our parents are having trouble parenting us in a new culture and same with our parenting groups um, it's really mainly guided by the parents and what types of things they would like to learn um, during those groups and I encourage you to ask the families questions themselves they usually have the solutions for the difficulties that they are facing and they're just looking to you to be that guidance to connect them to services that are available within Edmonton and I hope that I did my two minutes justice around uh, settlement integration and I, we just want to leave you with the quote here again that Kaylin opened up with and also with a message to let you know that you have a lot of power within your own communities beyond your profession it's really people like normal everyday Canadians that changed my family's life and my life um, uh, for for the better we came here as refugees and my dad was uh, my mom was working at a cafeteria and now she's a very well-known uh, broker with the multicultural health brokers my dad is a published author with the University of Alberta and has two books and it's people uh, it's teachers it's our Canadian friends that connected us to services it's um, our neighbors that were friendly to us when nobody else was it was the teacher that would leave a positive note in my back backpack before I left school those ordinary people really changed um, my life and my family's life and I encourage you to reach out to those communities and do anything in your power to be that positive influence um, on the lives of, of the refugees who are looking um, who are looking uh, to settle in this uh, in this beautiful country that we call Canada we're very blessed and very lucky so thank you again um, for giving me the opportunity to share and um, if anyone is interested in our full day workshop we have it on the 24th of March in Red Deer <laughs> Okay, thank you. So at this point, we're, we're opening to questions. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and Caitlin or Nika will be able to answer those. So we have a question from Christine. What are the next steps in helping communities to build welcoming communities? So I can speak for our center. Um, the next, the next steps that we are doing is we're continuing our youth groups. We're we're continuing the holistic support that we provide to the families. So connecting the parents to the services that they want, uh, working with the youth to figure it out in Canada, to figure out who they are. Are they Syrians? Are they Canadians? Helping them find volunteer opportunities, um, helping them find employment, um, getting the moms out. A lot of the moms are um, at home right now and um, just need a place to let loose. One of our women's group that we have, we asked the moms what they would like to do. Um, one of the biggest uh, concerns that they were, is the single moms, they're like, what do we do about dating? How do we get connected to dating uh, uh, services or dating sites? Like, we need to find a husband then. So you'll be really surprised by just asking questions and having conversations with the families um, about what they're looking to do for the next steps uh, to find um, to make some positive changes in their life. Okay, we 
just wanted to jump in and add something there. I think in terms of whether the next steps in coming to become welcoming, I think, I think another, another important is, is communication from leadership within the community, particularly when there's been so much negativity and miss around refugees and around Muslims in particular over the past year or so. And I think it starts with leadership taking a stand to say that our community welcomes these individuals. So, so I, I think, think having, having leaders publicly announce their support is an important piece. I think and another important piece that is creating opportunities for groups to get together. So whether that's we learn a number of different models, one being in class for community hosts, community wide dinners on Sunday evenings during the winter months as a way to bring the community together during winter when isolation is already higher and also to get to know everyone in the community. And there's two refugee families that have settled in, in Jasper and they were personally invited by members of the community. So I also think personally inviting, supporting refugees to come to events, whether that's helping with driving. If you think about when you attend an event where you didn't know anyone, having someone personally be there with you and almost be your guide probably made that experience more positive and eased it for you. Okay, our next question is from Brent. What are some of the unique challenges that refugees fa refugee seniors face and what can be done to address those needs? He indicates he's doing research on refugee seniors, so any info would be very helpful. Thank you, Brent, for your question. Uh, there is a wonderful seniors group composed of many different cultures with the multicultural health workers, and they meet uh, monthly to talk about the exact question that you're asking and ways to find support. Uh, some of the challenges that I've uh, seen myself among the Syrians uh, in the Kurdish community and the Iraqi community is isolation um, due to the fact that they cannot speak English and they're dependent on family members to get around from transportation to going to the grocery store. So I would say isolation and um, language is uh, one of the two biggest barriers that I've seen with seniors and what can be done to that is connecting seniors to English speaking seniors. Uh, it would uh, help with both the isolation piece and uh, hopefully improve the language piece. Um, helping them find a new community because um, it's, it's quite hard uh, for them uh, to socialize and to make friends uh, by being indoors most of the time because of their um, uh, language skills and um, not knowing just really about their about their communities due to that. And if you're interested to know more about, please do connect with me about the senior groups that we do have at the Multicultural Health Brokers. One question I have, Niga, is uh, when you talked about this slide around the financial assistance, I just want to clarify these numbers represent per month. Is that correct? Yes, these numbers represent per month. So each uh, each person is seven hundred and forty dollars. We now have a single woman who is really struggling to pay her rent, and we're looking for a roommate for her because she gets paid um, seven hundred and ninety dollars a month, and uh, it barely covers her rent, and it barely helps her get by get by to the end of the month. It's better for families who do have young children because of the child benefit tax for, for the single moms and for the adults, and uh, it's quite quite hard to get by with that money. And when you refer to the child benefit tax, you're referring to the same benefit that any other Canadian family would receive. Exactly. It would be the same as any Canadian family would receive. OK. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that clarify, clarifies things that it wasn't per week or, or, or whatnot. So any other questions uh, from our audience? OK. Not not seeing any. Um, okay, not seeing any questions. I uh, just want to, before we close, I want to highlight that in recognition of the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Canadian Commission for UNESCO has launched a social media campaign with the hashtag 
it starts with me. And they're encouraging municipal leaders to post a picture of themselves. It doesn't necessarily have to be municipal, but uh, anybody to post a picture of themselves holding a sign that states why they stand against racial discrimination in their community. And please try to uh, wear something red and the sign should also include the hashtag. Uh, it starts with me. And with that, uh, I want to remind everybody that if you want to get in touch with AMA's Welcoming and Inclusive Communities Initiative, please email us. Uh, I'm going to post uh, that information in the chat box right now. You can email us at wic at auma.ca or visit our website where we have numerous tools to support your communities to address racism and discrimination. And you can access that website at wic.auma.ca. And with that, I'd like to once again thank Caitlin and Nika for taking the time to discuss uh, this is a very important issue, and I'd like to also thank all of you for your, for participating. We look forward to engaging with you at again at a future webinar. Have a great day.